He seemed to like be the one who really enjoyed his job. On December the 27th, 1991, he's in command of a state-of-the-art DC-9. The flight will take him to the very edge of his abilities as his engines fail and his plane falls out of the sky. I was in a nightmare. Stockholm Scandinavian 751, we are crashing into the ground now. What caused the most baffling accident in Sweden's history is nothing investigators could have imagined. What they finally uncover will strain Rasmussen's lifelong relationship with airplanes to the breaking point. I really felt that I didn't trust the, the aircraft. It's two days after snow, slush, and ice. Passengers boarding a mid-morning Scandinavian Airlines flight to Copenhagen are finding the cabin very uncomfortable. It was really warm inside the plane when we entered because there had been like heaters on during night. And I saw when the passengers embarked, they also wanted to take off like jackets and shoes and because it was like a sauna. Is it possible to turn the heat down now? Thirty-four-year-old Ulf Sedermark has been with the airline for four years. He's the first officer on today's flight. It was a light snowfall. Temperature was just below freezing and light winds. We were going to fly Stockholm to Copenhagen and then to Warsaw, back to Copenhagen and down to Barcelona that day. It would be a quite a long working day. Stefan Rasmussen has just finished an exterior check of the plane. The Danish pilot is in command this morning. In those over 12, almost 13,000 hours I've been sitting there, I put the aircraft and back on my, like a rucksack. And, and when we are took lift on the wings, we melted together. The plane Rasmussen is strapping on today is a nearly new DC-9, easily identifiable by its two rear engines. By now, everyone should know that door stays open. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even in the days before terrorist threats, flying with the cockpit door open is unusual. It's just one way Rasmussen has endeared himself to the crews and passengers he flies with. I always had my cabin door open because I found out that if we had the door open and they could see that there were a human being in there, they'd trust you. For me, it felt good that the door was open. It just feels like you have a connection more than if the door is closed. The winter weather has delayed this flight, but Rasmussen won't compromise safety for schedule. Where are we now? Look at the icing. The winds aren't quite done. They've done the underside. Now they're doing the top. Thank you. Under Captain Rasmussen's instructions, the ground crew had already de-iced the plane once. Now they're giving it another pass. And it took a while, but they had trouble getting rid of the snow on top of the wing. Uh, so we were slightly late for their pushback. This kind of delay is routine business. He flies DC-9s for the airline. A passenger this morning, he is scheduled to command another flight later that day. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is your captain. I hope you had a good Christmas. We're just getting our wings cleared as we've had a bit of snow overnight. And when that's finished, we're ready for takeoff for some warmer weather. I handpicked the airline's best cabin crew to take care of you today. We all hope you have a nice flight. Finally, Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751 is cleared to proceed. There are build-ups of snow that the crew must avoid on the way to the runway. nice of them to clear the snow. Oh, that would have made it too easy. Approaching holding point, runway 08. Roger, Scandinavian 751. You are cleared for takeoff from runway 08. Spoilers? 
Armed. Auto brake, take off and armed. Runway update performed. Checklist completed. Set power. Despite the winter conditions, the takeoff is routine. V1, rotate. Gear up. Gear up selected. When Ulfi reached out for the gear, I heard things which was different. Just 25 seconds into the flight, as the plane is climbing, there is a problem. When you hear things that are different from the normally, you get suspicious. There was a really big roar in the aircraft, like, almost like an explosion. Boom! There was a, another banging noise that I just thought, what is that? I had never heard that before. It's obvious the source of the noise is the right engine. It sounds serious. I believe it's a compressor stop. I took the, the right throttle and I moved a little back. But there it, it really became strange because the engine uh, performance increased when I reduced the throttle. It's like if, if you're sitting in your car and you're turning you to the right, you get confused. We're not supposed to like call into cockpit now. And then I thought, this is an emergency. I have to call the captain. But Captain Rasmussen doesn't respond to the call. He's too busy trying to figure out what's going wrong with his plane. I couldn't see anything on the instrument. They were quite stable and and a quite normal range. Uh, and, uh, no no problem. But but I could hear those roaring every second. He searches for telltale signs of attack or structural failure. And I looked up at the, uh, the cabin pressure, because if you have a, a, a bump or, or a freight door or anything which is uh, ripped off, uh, that'll, that'll give a, a decompression. In the cabin, pressure levels are stable. But the crew has other concerns. I saw the smoke and it smelled burnt. What should we do about this? Just 3,200 feet above the ground, the emergency escalates. The right engine quits. When we have flown a little over one minute, uh, the right engine just... I had a very, very short moment of thinking that I was in a, in a nightmare and just dreaming. I was confused. I was really confused. Two seconds later, the left engine also quits. The plane is now powerless. One engine drop, and then another engine drop. I thought that it wasn't true. It wasn't true. It wasn't real. Less than a minute and a half after takeoff, the DC-9 begins falling from the sky. And after that, it was complete silence. And I think that was the worst moment for me. Just being in the air, and it's so quiet. It was like a bird just sailing through the sky. So then I started to, to get scared. Engine relay. As the pilots try to restart their engines, things get even worse. The left engine erupts in flames. And I saw the exhaust gas temperature was rising uh, rapidly. The max temperature was around 680 degrees Celsius. And a fire in the engine could spread to the rest of the plane. Should I pull? If Sadamark pulls the fire extinguisher in the left engine, he will never be able to restart it. He pulls the handle to put out the fire. From his seat, Captain Per Homburg can see that the crew is in trouble. Flight 751 is now falling at a rate of 1,200 feet per minute. 
But air traffic controllers at the Stockholm airport have no idea the plane is in trouble. Islander, Stockholm, Scandinavian 751. Good morning, SK 751. Climb to flight level 180. We have problems with our engines, please. We need to go back to... to go back to Arlanda. 751, roger. Turn right, heading to... Suddenly the radio goes dead. A result of the failed engines. Only the right engine can provide power, but it's now spinning too slowly to generate electricity. The engine, you don't have any propulsion, so you will... The only energy you have is your height. With time running out, the pilots of Flight 751 must find a way to restart the right engine, or else crash into the countryside below. Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751 is now falling from the sky at 20 feet per second. How can I help? Captain Per Holmberg, who boarded the flight as a passenger, becomes part of the flight crew. Oh, he came out in the cockpit and he said, is there anything I can help you with? I don't think I even said yes, I said just said, start the APU. If the auxiliary power unit can be launched, it will bring back the radio and instruments. So I just handed him the uh, emergency checklist and uh, started focus on controlling the flight to see that we were maintaining the speed and that the attitude and that we were wings level. He managed to start the auxiliary power unit, so my flight instruments were supplied from that. But for some reason, Captain Rasmussen's instruments don't come back online. He managed to, to fly the plane basically by feet. Power is also restored to the cabin. Extreme danger. Stockholm Air Traffic Control instructs the pilots to return to the airport. Scandinavian 751, are you able to turn right heading 090 zero radar vectoring for 0 1? But the plane is now just 1600 feet from the ground. And First Officer Sadermark's attempts to resuscitate it aren't working. Roger, we are maintaining our heading, but we are trying to restart our engines. Making a 180 degree turn back to Stockholm could be catastrophic. I really had the feeling that I've, if I turned the aircraft at that time, we would have stalled. When you're turning back, you are losing a lot of energy. So the most safe thing to do is actually just to go straight, uh, keep your wings level. That means that you will use less energy of your altitude, so you can maintain your speed. You can maintain 2,000 feet. We are not able to maintain 2,000 feet. We are descending. We are at 1,600 feet and descending. Holmberg wants Rasmussen to focus his attention on finding a landing spot. Look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. He was uh, screaming at Stefan, just to uh, look straight ahead and uh, watch the flight path. On ground emergency! Bend down! Bend down! Bend down! So we shouted bend down, I don't know how many times. Bend down, bend down, bend down. Keep your seatbelts fastened. While passengers brace, Rasmussen considers where to land his plane. Look straight ahead. And I had an idea that on the northern direction could bring us out to the to the Baltic Sea, which was at that time frozen. And that's an excellent runway. But instead, he finds himself gliding powerlessly over a dense forest. I saw that green area and I saw that little uh, light spot in the middle of the forest, but that really looked short. Steal right! Steal right! Just 500 feet above the ground, Captain Rasmussen lifts the plane's nose to slow it down, hoping to soften the crash landing. Pine trees from the top there look very soft. I could use the trees as uh, almost like a pillow. Should I lower the ladder? Bend down and hold your knees! I prepared myself for a hard impact. If it's an emergency landing, we have no engines. I just thought this is going to be a hard landing. Stockholm, Scandinavian 751. We are crashing into the ground now. 
I, I wasn't afraid until we were flying into the trees. Then I was scared, and I knew we were not going to make it. I didn't thought I should die. I knew I should die. I, I, I made my prayer to God. And then, uh, moment after, uh, we were we were uh, we were in a strange world. After we have come to a complete stop, I feel uh, the smell of airplane fuel. I thought, okay, we're going to explode. And I look around and I see the snow because there was a big crack uh, in the airplane fuselage just in front of, on the ground. Everything was quiet and um, I woke up. It might only have been a split second or so. I was afraid that my spine was broken, that I wasn't, wouldn't be able to walk again. So I remember I was sitting there and I was moving my toes and my feet just to see if I could have control over them. I had a pain in my hand because I had broken a bone in my hand and I was bleeding heavily from my forehead. So I was trying to get clear of all the blood that was coming down in my eyes. And uh, Stefan told me that we had to get out of the aircraft. After plowing through 125 meters of pine forest, the pilot's fear is now that the broken aircraft could catch fire. Dozens of passengers escape through the breaks in the fuselage walls. But Captain Per Holmberg has been knocked unconscious by the crash. It all went so fast that like no one could take in like what happened. So I tried to, to stay with the group of passengers I had there. But I just knew the feeling also that we had to wait a long time for, for the rescue teams. Help will be here soon. Fortunately, no fire materializes. A sweltering plane. Many passengers are starting to freeze. Most people were just standing in their shirts, t-shirts, very, very little clothes. Few didn't even have shoes on. They are now at risk from hypothermia. So I focused on, on being caring. Maybe I did it for my own sake also. I needed a hug also. It was uh, comforting to like comfort someone else. The wreckage of Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751 lies just 15 kilometers northeast of Stockholm Arlanda Airport. The fuselage has broken into three pieces. In the chaos of the moment, nobody knows how many people have been killed in the crash. Rescuers arrive within minutes and attend to the freezing survivors. They pull Captain Per Holmberg from the cabin, unconscious. He landed on the uh, wall at impact and he skidded down on the wall to, to the floor at impact, so he, he was quite badly Damage. He, uh, he cut his uh, eyelid and he also got his uh, shoulder was in front of him. 92 of the passengers have sustained injuries. Only eight are considered serious. But when the crew conducts a head count, they're stunned to learn that out of the 129 people who boarded Flight 751, not a single one was killed in the crash. <sighs> Everyone survived was like a, a shock just to take in. Wow, that was a fantastic comment. Just I was the happiest captain in the world. We were all alive. That was a great moment. Reporters break the remarkable story to the world. As the Swedish Accident Investigation Board, or SAIB, takes charge of the case. Scandinavian Airlines alerts its own investigators dispatching Tori Hultgren to head up its team. It's most unusual that the plane crashes in, in a wooded area and everybody survives and never heard of it before. The police kept everybody off the site itself. It was a cordon around the aircraft about 100 meters. 
We had a complete aircraft, nothing happened. Henrik Ullander from the SAIB gets to work on the evidence. And we all started to plan the documentation of, of the accident site, which means photographing all the, the, the final approach through the wood, you know, and, uh, and to, to take photos of all the parts that were spread all over the place. The two black boxes, which record cockpit conversations and store flight data, are recovered immediately. Investigators speak to survivors. Everyone tells a similar story. Would you mind telling me what you saw and heard? Loud, booming sounds from the engines moments after the flight began. Smoke in the cabin. And finally, the entire loss of power and an engine on fire. You have a twin engine aircraft and you are really not supposed to lose both engines at the same time. The Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines are sent to a Scandinavian Airlines repair shop for closer examination. Investigators are eager to speak with Captain Rasmussen about the incident. But to their dismay, Scandinavian Airlines takes him to the media first. Uh, the first question, what did you think when boat engine refused to function? <laughs> <All that. laughs> the normal case is that the, the key witnesses, like the crew and so on, should be kept in, in quarantine until they meet the investigation board. European media celebrate Captain Stefan Rasmussen as a hero for landing the DC-9 without engine power. But investigators consider the possibility that he or his co-pilot had made errors that caused the crisis in the first place. The honor and the glory always rests with the captain, but so does also the mishaps. I knew that being a person where the, in the spotlight of the press would be a, a, a quite different situation. And I said to myself, the only thing you can do now is to give them all the story and then pray that they will find the reason. Lars Lindberg is an investigative representative for the Swedish Airlines Pilot Association. He examines the wreckage for signs of mechanical or structural failure. We knew both engines had failed for some reason, uh, so we was concerned. Uh, the first time I saw the, the engines uh, in the workshop, I was surprised. Is this all they found? There, there was a number of parts that, uh, that, that were completely uh, missing and this was something we hadn't seen uh, before to this extent. To find out what happened, investigators must find the missing pieces, which now lie somewhere in snow-covered fields and forests. A close study of Scandinavian Airlines Flight 751's engines reveals exactly which pieces are missing. Part of this aircraft was shedding parts from both engines. And then what, what you do is you go further in and you document everything and you try to find the root cause and see how it all comes together. The missing pieces could hold the key to discovering why both of the plane's engines quit within seconds of each other. But they could be anywhere along the 15 kilometer route the aircraft covered during its short flight. They must be found. Investigators use the flight data recorder to map the plane's journey and determine where engine parts may have fallen. Builds along the plane's path. The recovery team finds 500 fragments. Just a fraction of what's missing. Many are very badly damaged. Some of the titanium blades actually seem to have been on fire. You had this titanium fire inside both engines, both the right and the left engine. And this titanium fire is a very unique occurrence. You, it's requiring very, very high pressure and very high temperature for a titanium blade to catch fire. Investigators dig deeper into the cause of the engine trouble. The left engine's fuel line is badly dented. It was obviously hit by a fast-moving piece of metal inside the engine. The impact caused it to rupture. This part got dislodged, it went out and hit the fuel line. 
and that fuel line cracked, sprayed fuel onto the hot engine. The engine was clearly coming apart during the flight. That sounds serious. The discovery explains the fire in the left engine and why so many pieces of it were found so far from the crash site. But investigators are left wondering why the engines broke up in the first place. A major clue comes from passenger and crew before the left engine caught fire. The cockpit voice recorder picked up these sounds. You can hear that and we could correlate that with when uh, the damage occurred. You can see that on the flight data recorder. The sounds are familiar to investigators and leave no doubt. The DC-9's engines began surging shortly after takeoff. Jet engines rely on a steady stream of air for combustion. A series of fans move incoming air through various stages of compression. But when that flow is disrupted, fuel at the rear of the engines ignites violently and shoots forward. That's a surge. You can have a small surge and you can have a large surge. And you can have the complete surge on the whole engine. It sounds serious. This surge process was very violent, so after a very short time, we had an aircraft with two engines that could not be restarted, that didn't generate any thrust. Basically, you had a giant glider uh, at that point. A closer look at the fan blades from the front of the engines explains why they were surging. They're badly dented them from effectively directing air to the rear of the engines. This damage that twisted the fan blade started this process. You got this disturbed air in the fan. You got this rotating fan stall that then triggered this whole breakdown, the compressor surge, and then the whole process that led up to the dual engine failures. But what exactly mangled the blades? There are ways to tell. Yeah, if it comes from a stone, rubber, ice and so on, you can see it on the shape of the damage. The ice causes very specific uh, damages. It's, it's sort of like a soft dent. Analysis of dent patterns on the fan blades is conclusive. They were struck by ice. Now investigators want to find out where the ice could have come from. Weather data for the 24 hours leading up to the crash. They know Stockholm had been hit with rain and snow in the hours before Flight 751 took off. It was a situation with the, uh, the temperature around 0 degrees. It was a drizzle snow rain in the morning. They learned that the DC-9 arrived from Zurich the night before, with the fuel tanks more than half full. They had quite a large amount of reserve fuel, of diversion fuel, in their wing, where close to minus 20 degrees Celsius. The conditions that night were ideal for the formation of clear ice on the wing surface. And here you had very, very cold fuel on the top wing skin. And as the temperature dropped during the night, it went to snow and rain and finally snow. So there was a layer cake. Ice at the bottom, slush and snow on top. About 10, 10 inches total on top of the wings in the morning. Responsibility for but de-icing the plane ultimately falls on the captain. Rasmussen insists he was aware of the overnight build-up. Investigators wonder if the pilot did all he could to ensure his plane was completely free of ice. Rasmussen claims he instructed technicians to de-ice the plane thoroughly. I didn't walk around with the aircraft. It was cold. It was uh, frosty. Noticing that there was still frost on the wings, the head technician ordered a second round of de-icing. I was really convinced that the aircraft was clean. And so was he. So was he. Where are we now with the de-icing? The wings aren't quite done. They've done the underside. The cockpit voice recorder backs up Rasmussen's testimony. They got it good and Once, they looked at it and I said, once more, and they de-iced as the second time. In fact, a total of 850 litres of fluid was sprayed on the aircraft. But the fluid may have been faulty, not potent enough to melt the thick layer of ice that had accumulated on the wings overnight. Technicians test samples of the fluid used to de-ice Flight 751. 
we, we found no discrepancies. There was nothing wrong with any of the fluids used. But when investigators interview the maintenance crew that worked on the plane, they begin wondering if the de-icing team was thorough enough in their efforts. The ground crew insists that after they sprayed the wing, it appeared to be clean. But that appearance was deceptive. It looked perfect, because the clear ice on top of the fuel tanks, you cannot see the clear ice. A technician inspected the front of the wing and found no ice. He couldn't have known that there was ice further back, out of his reach. No provisions for stairs or anything that he could use to get up on the wing at the de-icing platform. It looked shiny and nice, couldn't see any ice on it, much of ice on top of the wing, when the aircraft took off. As soon as the plane took flight, the ice became a problem. On this aircraft, the engines are positioned behind the wings. And as the aircraft rotated and the wings bent in order to take the weight of the aircraft, this ice in the wing roots loosened and it sucked right into the engine. The ice damaged the fan blades at the front of the engines and ultimately caused them to begin surging. Nobody really expected that this would happen, or could happen, but it did. When ice breaks off the wings during flight, it doesn't pose a problem for most aircraft. But the placement of a DC-9's engines leaves them more susceptible to being struck. The Pratt & Whitney engines on Flight 751 were designed to withstand this type of ice ingestion. Something else must explain the disaster. Investigators know that the wrong reaction by a pilot can make surges worse. They comb through the flight data to see what these pilots did when the emergency struck. The first thing you do when you have a surge, if you recognize it at the surge, is that you reduce power. Captain Rasp. Of course, you just pull the, the throttle back, and then you have the, the balance between the incoming fuel and incoming air. And uh, that was actually what I did. But the flight data recorder tells a different story. Why is the engine power increasing? It clearly shows that in the moments after the surge, thrust was reduced, but then seconds later was increased to beyond full power. Yeah, it didn't add up because the, the RPM was increasing to 110%, and the throttle position was moving. It shouldn't be. The only thing that could move the throttles in clamp was the pilot's hand. But if Rasmussen didn't push the throttles forward, something else did. It would explain the captain's confusion as his engines began to surge. As a pilot, when, when you when you gone through the training, you've done all your emergency training, you've been through the simulator, and now you have a system that is doing something uh, that you don't expect, it, it's very confusing. Despite their relentless efforts, investigators can find no possible explanation for the increase in thrust. The frustrating part with the investigation was that we could not figure out why the system did what it did. Then, almost two months after the accident, the plane's manufacturer provides the answer. The culprit is something... It's brand new. It automatically increases the thrust during the climb. Swedish authorities learned that automatic thrust restoration, or ATR, was recently introduced as a safety feature on Scandinavian Airlines planes. It existed because the FAA had discovered some pilots were throttling back considerably while taking off and landing to reduce noise over residential neighborhoods. The ATR was designed to make it impossible for them to throttle back to dangerous levels. So as soon as he powered back, the system kicked in. Investigators learned that when Rasmussen reduced power to clear his engine surge, the system read this as a dangerously low power setting and pushed the throttles forward. The increased thrust made the surging worse until the engines destroyed themselves. The investigation concludes that the pilots had taken the right steps to clear the surge and prevent the catastrophe. But the computer code which governs the ATR undermined their efforts. A strip of zeros and ones caused the throttles to move and caused the engines that were stalling because they already got too much fuel, got even more engines on the 
in, in a few seconds. We're both totally destroyed. The system was so new to Scandinavian airlines that nobody there had even heard of it. And it was confusing for everyone because we, we didn't know about the system, we didn't have uh, information on the system. SAS didn't know the system existed on their aircraft. We hadn't bought that modification. And it was sneaked in via another system. Because he didn't know about the ATR, Rasmussen was unaware that he could only save his plane by switching it off. News that the automatic thrust restoration was responsible for the accident proved both a blessing and a curse for Captain Rasmussen. It eliminated any notion that he had made a mistake. When I got that message, I was really released. It was like uh, winning in a lottery. It was, uh, you know, because I was so happy. Uh, because then I could explain why I was in that total coma confusion. But the fallout would ultimately destroy a lover. On October the 20th, 1993, the Swedish Accident Investigation Board releases its report on the crash of Flight 751. It determines that the actions of Captain Rasmussen and First Officer Sedemark contributed to the safe outcome of this incident. And although investigators question Captain Per Holmberg's decision to enter the cockpit in the first place, they do praise his contribution. This crew flew until they stood still on the ground. They never gave up. They never gave up. They didn't give an inch. The investigators put much of the blame for the accident on Scandinavian Airlines because their procedures for checking for clear ice were inadequate. It's a compressor store. The report also condemns the fact that the pilots didn't know about the automatic thrust restoration and how it would act in a surge situation. If the ATR system hadn't been there, if, if the trolls hadn't moved forward, uh, there wouldn't have been an accident. It wasn't uh, available to us, so we knew what we could expect if something like this would happen. In the wake of the crash, Scandinavian Airlines started training its pilots how to use the ATR system. They also implemented steps to ensure airplanes don't take off with clear ice on the wings. We changed all the procedures, we provided stairs for the mechanic, and we made it a requirement to go up on top of the wing and touch it with your hand to verify after the icing. After healing from his injuries, First Officer Ulf Sedemark returned to the cockpit. I didn't feel the responsibility that, uh, that I wouldn't be able to do my job again. Whatever happens, I know that I, I still can see things for what they are. And I still love doing my job, and if something bad happens, I can deal with it. But Stefan Rasmussen's return proved far more difficult. Set power. After I had from a high-skilled psychologist, we talked about getting in the air again. He knew that that would be a hard decision to take. Gear up. Go. <laughs> After time in the simulator, Rasmussen couldn't regain confidence in his plane. Sorry, guys. In a disaster situation, in a, in a crisis, is that you have optimized the teamwork between man and machine. I really felt that, that I didn't trust the, the aircraft. The pilots tends to take the responsibility for all that went wrong. Too much of the glory and also too much of the responsibility. With the right counseling, about 90% of pilots involved in an accident are able to continue flying. 
even though Captain Rasmussen received treatment. His career ended with the crash of Flight 751. Taking that decision to leave uh, aviation as pilot was like uh, having you, your highest love and um, come to that conclu conclusion that uh, uh, I had many hours, many missions of happiness in an aircraft. And uh, I loved my passengers, I loved my aircraft so much, so I said, that's it. I never regret it, never. <laughs>